Hello, this video will be about the practice known as p-hacking. I will first describe what a p-value is, then I'll go over ways it can be hacked, why it is a problem, how it is most often carried out, and finally provide some suggestions for best practices. So what is a p-value? Generally, it helps determine whether some outcome is statistically significant under the framework of null hypothesis testing. For nearly a century, many researchers across various disciplines have deployed the use of p-values to evaluate their outcomes. Specific examples of such outcomes cover a wide range. For example, the results of an experiment that saw treatment groups report reduced pain compared to some control group, or observational data showing few, fewer people calling cabs on sunny versus rainy days. The common technical definition of the p-value is the probability of arriving at the observed results or more extreme results given the null hypothesis is true. For example, if I want to test the effectiveness of a drug at mitigating pain post-surgery and I randomly assign a random sample of patients to a treatment group where they receive the drug or a control group where they do not receive the drug, then I'll then I'll ask patients to report their pain on a scale. In this example, our goal is to reject the null hypothesis, which would state reported pain between treatment and control is the same. The difference between the treatment and control group would be the outcome. The p-value would tell me what the probability of observing that same outcome or bigger if the drug had no effect. In other words, if the null hypothesis were true. A high p-value would indicate a high likelihood that the outcome was due to chance, but a low p-value would indicate a low likelihood that the outcome was just due to chance. Statistical significance is based on a cutoff used for the p-value placed on the lower end, and an often used cutoff is to declare statistics, statistical significance is 0.05. It is important to note that the p-value does not provide the probability your outcome is true, does not provide a magnitude of your outcome, and does not even provide you a probability of the null hypothesis being true. The extent to which p-values are misinterpreted was best described by an example from Goodman 2008. In a recent study of medical residents published in the Journal of American Medical Association, 88% expressed fair to complete confidence in interpreting p-values, yet only 62% of these could answer an elementary p-value interpretation question correctly. However, it is not just those statistics that testify to the difficulty in interpreting p-values. In an exquisite irony, none of the answers offered for the p-value questions was correct. Meaning, even the tests used to assess knowledge of p-values had some error. My goal is not to go in depth into hypothesis testing or further technical description of the p-value, but just to provide some background of p-value definitions and how they're misinterpreted. So now to actual p-hacking. P-hacking is carrying out analyses not planned in advance after observing a non-significant p-value with the purpose of uncovering a significant p-value. The problem with p-hacking is that you are increasing the likelihood of uncovering a significant p-value by chance alone when repeated unplanned analyses are conducted. These false discoveries increase the likelihood of committing a type 1 error where you wrongly reject a null hypothesis that is true. There are many ways this can be done. Nine different ways of p-hacking were outlined by Matulski 2014. As you can see in the diagram from left to right, when you begin, you analyze your data. Then if you observe a statistically significant p-value, here a p-value of less than 0.05, you can stop and report your results. However, if you do not observe a statistically significant p-value, you can begin hacking by performing one of the nine following techniques to attempt to discover a statistically significant p-value. I will briefly go over each way of p-hacking starting from the 
right cell, the upper right cell. Now, collecting more observations to increase your sample size. Matulski demonstrated through a simulation that progressively increasing your sample size for experiments that did not have a significant that did not have significant discoveries led to a higher percentage of significant discoveries than when selecting a larger, larger sample size from the start. Now, for the next way of hacking is analyzing only a subset. For example, if you discover that an outcome is only significant with younger versus older participants. Okay, so the next, uh, you can next example is you can include more variables in your model for example throwing additional demographic variables into your model next you can adjust the data the example mentioned is dividing by body weight your variables next you can transform the data for example with a log transfer transformation of skewed variables uh, may allow you to uh, may allow it to be uh, more normally distributed, that specific variable. Next, you can remove suspicious outliers. Though generally a good practice, it, it can be problematic when done as a reaction to a non-significant outcome. Okay, now next, picking a different group to use as a control. For example, if you carried out a study with a treatment and control and did not see a significant difference, so you look at the control group further and observe some participants may have taken something that could have uh, produced similar effect as your treatment and you sit out and you decide to just adjust your control group to exclude those participants. Next, you can also look at different outcome variables altogether. For example, originally having reported pain as your dependent variable and after observing a non-significant difference using reported mobility as the dependent variable instead. And finally, using a different statistical test. One example provided is running a non-parametric test after observing a non-significant parametric test. So, as described, p-hacking can lead to false discoveries, which can lead to nonsensical findings. This was demonstrated in a comedy skit by John Oliver, where he goes through several nonsensical findings that were taken from scientific journals and reported by mainstream news sources, likely without context. These reported findings include a study suggesting hugging your dog was bad for your dog, and another one which suggested drinking a glass of wine was as good as spending an hour at the gym. I will leave a link to the video in the description if you want to check it out. These findings may have been a result of p-hacking, poor reporting practices from mainstream media outlets, or some other factor. P-hacking has been attributed as a factor to the reproducibility crisis, where findings from studies are not reproduced. However, it has also been suggested that p-hacking may not be as prevalent as we expect in the literature. This was described by Finelli 2017, in the following ex excerpt referring to p-hacking. Referring to p-hacking, their impact on the reliability of the literature appears to be contained. Analyses based on the distribution of p-values reported in the medical, medical literature, for example, suggested a false discovery rate of only 14%. A similar but broader analysis concluded that p-hacking was common in many disciplines and yet had minor effect in distorting conclusions of meta-analyses. Moreover, the same analyses found a much stronger evidential value in the literature of all disciplines, which suggests that the majority of published studies are measuring true effect, a finding that again contradicts the belief that most published findings are false positives. So, it is very important to note that all the way of all the ways of p hacking mentioned are great ways to explore your data. To avoid p hacking, you can simply be honest about any analyses not planned in advance. There may also be appropriate post hoc analyses available that would mitigate the problem of false discoveries. It is also important to consider that not all research investigations are the same. Experimental designs with random assignment are more powerful than non-experimental designs, 
some investigations are more comprehensive than others, and meta-analyses which aggregate results of similar studies may be better than uh, may provide better outcomes than uh, single studies. There have also been other recommendations such as reporting of effect size if possible, along with p-values to describe magnitude of the outcome. Another recommendation is to consider not using the frequentist approach of p-values and instead use the Bayesian approach for with Bayes factor. Bayesian statistics has been gaining increased use across discipline as an alternative. Now, finally, even when all tests are conducted as recommended and a significant p-value was found, it is also best practices to consider it as just a first step for future research, as stated by Goodman 2008 when describing Fisher's original intended definition for statistical significance. Fisher proposed the use of the term significant to be attached to small p-values and the choice of that particular word was quite deliberate. The meaning he attended was quite close to the, word, the word's common language interpretation something worthy of notice. The operational meaning of a p-value less than 0.05 was merely that one should repeat the experiment. If subsequent studies also yield significant p-values, one could conclude that the observed effect were unlikely to be the result of chance alone. So significance is merely that, worthy of attention in the form of meriting more ex experimentation, but not proof in itself. Overall, p-value misuse or even unintended use and p-hacking should be something researchers should always be mindful of. I hope you found this video useful. Let me know your thoughts in the comments or feel free to reach out to me as I also provide consultation services. Thank you and have a great day.